Johnny Carson, and this program is called The Squirrel's Nest, sometimes family matinee, and uh, sometimes quite a few other things. Well, what I like about television, I'm still doing on this show, The Tonight Show, what basically I did in Omaha 35 years ago. I mean, it's a live show, although we tape it a few hours before broadcast, we don't edit it, we don't uh, shoot it out of sequence, we don't augment it with laughter, we don't uh, put in laugh tracks, we don't do any of that. So I'm doing here exactly what I did in Omaha, in a sense, 35 years ago. The Omaha Telecasters Educational Foundation proudly presents Omaha Television, The Early Years. The year was 1949. Harry Truman was in the White House. The streetcar was a popular way to get downtown, and believe it or not, tokens were three for a quarter. And Omaha Television was born. On July 1st, 1949, the general manager of radio station WOW, Johnny Gillen, turned on the transmitter of WOW-TV, and the first experimental television was on the air in Omaha. Sound power amplifier has been pushed. Now we're on the air on TV, anyway. Uh, those people who are listening in can hear WOW on channel 6, WOW-TV. Now there's one final operation, that's to push the picture PA the picture PA has been pushed, Bill. And those tuned in can now see the WOW uh, test pattern on the air. That's exactly what we're seeing in this transmitter room, by the way. And it's showing up very clearly and brightly in, in this light. But the few people who had television sets in those days had to be satisfied with watching a test pattern because the first regularly scheduled programming didn't begin for another two months. On August 29th, 1949, WOW-TV began daily commercial broadcasting, the first station on the air in five Midwestern states. I want to welcome you to Channel 6. Yes, Channel 6. And I want you to know that today, a lot of you people are seeing for the first time in your own homes television. And believe you me, that television set of yours is going to be the center of things in your home for a long time to come. It was three days later, on September 1st, that television station KMTV began daily broadcasting. May broadcasting president Ed May and his mother, the late Gertrude May, flipped the switch, putting KMTV on the air. The May family had been pioneers in radio. So when there was a new thing coming on the scene called television, I guess we thought we wanted to take a look at it. So the little country boys from southwestern Iowa, I guess you might say, we, we kind of walked in the back door. It was, it was a wonderful decision. At the time, it, it, was, a, it, it was a big decision to make. But uh, we have never regretted making it. We would certainly make it again. Though there were fewer than 2,500 television sets in area homes, Omaha had become one of the few cities in the nation with two commercial stations on the air. A short eight years later, on September 17, 1957, Omaha's third commercial station, KETV, signed on. By 1957, several thousand homes within 100 miles of Omaha had television sets. General Manager Eugene Thomas welcomed the viewers. One o'clock, as I remembered, 1 p.m. See, the network didn't feed earlier than that. But we went on the air at that hour and with just a, I was right here in this studio, I guess, and simply said that uh, we had built the station, talking from the largest studio in, in Nebraska. We were very happy with our facilities, but we realized that we were using uh, God-given waves and so on uh, in a community that deserved the best, and that's what our staff was going to devote its efforts to. Basically, that was it, because I knew they didn't want a lot of words from me. And so then we went into the programming. KETV staged a parade through downtown Omaha to commemorate its entry into the local television market. A young actor named James Garner, who was the star of the new television series Maverick, was one of the main attractions. There was a common ground shared by the men and women who pioneered television in Omaha. 
This medium was so new to all of them that everything, virtually everything they put on the air, was innovative. Hi there, everybody. Yes, it is 12.15, and time once again for you and I to have our little regular visit on the coffee counter. You know, each day, as part of WOW-TV's Great Noon Hour show, we have 15 minutes where we drink a little coffee and meet a lot of very interesting people. Remember that in those days you didn't have uh, any network feed. You got some very poor kinescopes, and really they didn't come along when we first opened the station. So what you were trying to do was to find things to fill time, and it was really uh, uh, taking the idea of, of what was an old radio interview and trying to put it into some visual context. Got they got a sponsor program, called uh, uh, Butternut Coffee, and, and uh, that probably uh, led to the idea of a coffee corner, which was a very logical place to have a sort of an open and freewheeling discussion. And uh, in a very large sense, it was kind of the beginning of uh, today's talk show. can't say, huh? Now listen, you just relax and have a good cup of coffee because that's okay, part of our coffee that, counter routine. Hello, everybody. I'm Martha Bolson, and this is our new WOW television kitchen. In case you haven't joined us before, I would like to remind you that we meet here in the kitchen every afternoon at 3.30. That is, Monday through Friday. Television was a novelty to begin with, and yes, you're right. We didn't have all the prepared foods, nor TV dinners, or anything like that. And there weren't as many married women working, uh, mothers working, as we have today. So they were doing more cooking. They were interested in cooking and canning and freezing, everything in season, around the clock. We just prepared things and kept going with it. I, um, I think we ought to uh, talk to Oh, go right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're not supposed to just stand and look at them, are we? No. Like, like we do sometimes. Did you hear else asking me to say anything? Oh, oh. <laughs> you go right ahead. The, I think, though, that the audience enjoyed the mistakes, too, because it showed the thing was real. Now you can cut it out, do retakes on it, or, or do something like that, since uh, so much of it is taped. But there you were. There was nothing you could do about it. It was live. If there was an error, it was there before God and everybody to see. Hello, everybody. This is our uh, new WOW television kitchen, and I'm Martha Bolson. I'm here this afternoon to an all. Television programming in those early days was certainly different than it is now. Before the network coaxial cable had extended as far west as the Missouri River, the local stations had to generate their own programming to fill the time. Talk shows, talent shows, and a variety of kitchen shows quickly became a part of the regular menu of local programming. W-O-W calling. If you hate to do dishes, you'll love that dress. Draft, America's favorite suds for dishes, presents W.O.W. Calling with Mort Wells and the Drafter. It was all so new to us that we really didn't know uh, what was going to take place each day. All we had was a little format to go on, and, and a lot of times it turned out just the way we thought it would, and a lot of times it didn't. And the Drafters open our show this bright and sunshiny noon hour with a convivial suggestion. Let's have another one. Anytime you, you get a bunch of musicians that get up in the morning and they're glad to go to work, it's got to be something very interesting. And it was such a challenge to all of us. get away from just a band set, you know, with the microphones, so we would uh, pre-record, you know, do the, uh, do the uh, music on tape, and then the singers would lip-sing it, and then the, the whole group could move around the studios and we'd get a little production. If my hours could be spent near you, I 
You never knew exactly what you were going to do, and you did it live, so you had to try a little harder. If it worked, well, you got lucky. Everything was live, and that, uh, that's how you did it. In black and white, you didn't have to worry about too many colors, you know. <laughs> Everything looked good. It was either gray or black, you know. I just thought at the time that there was a decided lack of uh, imagination for children and that they shouldn't have to dash out and buy things to do things and that people weren't concentrating on the good old fairy tales and all those neat things, so I thought I'd put together a program and call it, <laughs> very imaginatively, the TV Babysitter. And it was a half-hour show, and on that I did the fairy tales and I wrote the original music for them, and then we had chalk talks and we had a little Mr. Jingo that was a hand puppet over the top of the easel that, and the chalk talks were pictures upside down. You know, you draw them one way and they come out. And then we also celebrate the kids' birthdays and then they send in pictures lots of times I'd ask them, you tell me what you think the story, something about the story. Sometimes the stories weren't that animated. You know, we do things like, you know, water and things like that. And because I use the piano all the way through, you know. You know what things that kind of thing to to emphasize the story. That was with our sound effects. And it was a joy. <laughs> Well, hi there. Welcome to Lyle's Patio. I'm Lyle DeMoss, and this here is Nitty. Hi. Uh, we're going to be, um, what are we going to be cooking today? I <laughs> guys said darn many things, you can't tell them all. I cooked everything in advance, and then I prepared and put the same thing on the grills at the time that we started the program. Well, we're going to do this today, and, and we tie it up, and here's the way you tie a chicken and so forth, and this is how you do this. And then when we said, let's go over and see how our chickens are doing, they go over and lift up the grill. There they were, just brown and beautiful, you know. And we learned that trick. Uh, it was a trick. It was hard to manage. And it's been on here about 20 minutes. Now, let me show you how beautifully that chicken cooks up. We had some of the most amazing success stories with that program. It, it, it was unbelievable to me. And every time I'd go someplace, and a sponsor or, or anybody, you know, that had watched the show from that side, from the customer's side, not the, uh, I mean, the, the people that bought the program. Uh, every time one of them would compliment me, I'd go home and tell my wife, my gosh, what do you know? And uh, it, it got to the point where it was almost more than I could handle. By the way, we'll be back, uh, I guess, uh, the same time next week. Thanks so much for tuning in on us. And until we do meet, cook up a storm, will you? They call me the pioneer of exercises in the area. As a matter of fact, it was interesting. Frank Petty, who a lot of people remember, uh, contacted me and asked me if I thought I could handle a half-hour section or segment, three-segment show at KMTV. And I said, sure, I can. And uh, so that was to involve my exercises, interviews, and then uh, a bit in the kitchen. It was fun, it was terrific, but I had to change my type of wardrobe because I had, was wearing the pants, you know, but I thought, well, to be just dressed properly, I should have a skirt on for the interviews. So I started out with the, with the pants, do my exercises, then during commercial, if I didn't do the commercial, which many times I did, but if I didn't do the commercial, I would slip a skirt around me, or while they were changing, setting up or something, I would slip a skirt around me, which was a wrap around, then I'd sit for the interview interviewed a lot of interesting people from, uh, from Hollywood and New York, and that was really great. Then I'd flip back in the kitchen after another commercial and have the sack of groceries there and pull them out and what's this and what that, and do a commercial for the items I was taking out. So it was wonderful. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our grassroots program. Certainly nice to have you with us today. And on the farm topics, we lead off with the statement about the hog situation. It was an exciting time. Uh, they didn't know what to compare it to. We didn't know what to compare it to. So we just played along and by trial and error. And here we are for our special guest today. We'd like to have you meet uh, 
Virginia Jensen. How do you do, Virginia? How do you do? Virginia uh, just came back from Chicago, and in Chicago, Virginia was named as the ideal farmer's daughter. Virginia, did it give you quite a thrill? It certainly did. I don't think we knew what we were getting into. I think we were, we went into it completely blind. They were so new to everybody that they would take in everything. We had a, a show on in the evening at 8 o'clock, prime time, uh, called In Your Own Backyard. And uh, in, we had a set that was supposed to be like my backyard. And uh, people were really intrigued with that sort of thing. In fact, uh, they would call my home after the show was over to ans ask a question about gardening or lawns, which was the subject. I said, oh, we, we just really learned by uh, uh, almost the seat of your pants. People would just go in and they'd roll the camera out and we were on the air. I remember in one corner we had Martha Bolson, whom I know you've got some film of, and her set would be down at one end and then I think the news set would be uh, another 10 or 15 feet away and then Mel Hansen, I think, had a farm report and there'd be another little set over here. Coffee counter, I think, Don Keel used to do. Then I had my set over in the other corner. So all five sets were just kind of uh, set around the perimeter of the studio. Uh, Josh, well, that makes me mad. Well, I don't care. If you can't come in and go to a Christmas party without... Oh, give him over. another piece of cake. You want a piece of cake, Bob? Give, yeah. him, a, give him a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> give him a piece of cake. <laughs> piece of cake if you can't have a nice Christmas. Merry Christmas. Fellas, I'm ready. This is the Christmas spirit. Put that inside. The trick, of course, was just to try to find things to do. We had turtle races, uh, one of our more exciting things. Uh, because with turtle races, you see, you could kill a lot of time. You were glad to do it. And there was no money in television in those days, but nobody cared because you were, you were learning what it was all about. And Ray Clark speaking with the Standard TV News Roundup. And in the news tonight... But the local TV television was far more than an entertainment medium. Nothing did more to enhance the station's reputation than its local newscasts. We didn't really notice any impact of television news here until the 1952 flood. I think we're going to hold it. What do you think, General? Well, you'll notice here on the flood wall, we've got a uh, three-foot freeboard, and I think that's going to be enough to hold it here. But you always have... We came of age in the 1952 flood. The, the work that we did on that story taught us more than any other single thing and I think made people in the community aware of what television news was all about and what it uh, could do for them. That it was quite a service and that it was, that it was not just some experiment or wild idea of some guy or group of persons, but that it was here to stay. This end of the Council Bluff side is critical, just as the north end of the Omaha side has been critical all these days. One of the fellows up on the line just a moment ago said if we hold this first quarter, a mile and a quarter of the Council Bluff dike, we'll probably hold the whole thing. This is the spot. That was when we saved Omaha and Council Bluff, with the big splashboarding and all of the dikes and everything, with that river a mile deep between the two cities. I remember our first uh, uh, view was from the top of the Woodman of the World building. And uh, we had our cameras up there. We could go to the airport and look out there and see how that was and see how the whole city was and how Council Bluffs was and so forth. And uh, Garraway wanted a shot every morning for, for the today's show. And we sent that to him from the top of the Woodman building. The common cry Omaha's of, reputation as an outstanding television news market quickly spread nationwide. It became a foundation on which many careers were built. This is the launch control center for Atlas F, the pioneer missile in the Strategic Air Command's underground air force. In this concrete and steel shelter, two stories below quiet Nebraska farmland, a highly trained missile crew is on alert, fighting the Cold War. We were allowed to be real journalists before it was possible in your major eastern and western markets. Uh, essentially, on the east coast, on the west coast, in your major cities, you had a problem with union jurisdiction so that one person was a writer and then there was a staff announcer who read 
and another person, maybe you had a street reporter, but just as likely you uh, rewrote from the newspapers. Uh, from my first job on, you covered the city council, you covered the police beat, the fire beat, uh, you went to the Chamber of Commerce meetings. So it was uh, the kind of training and experience that prepared you to be a broadcast journalist. I think it was terribly important. Today, the SAC bomber force is powered by jet engines, and the backbone of that force is the B-52 Strata Fortress. Brokaw took away my title as youngest newscaster in Omaha when... Uh, he arrived to do the morning cut-ins on the Today Show for uh, KMTV. Uh, but I think both of us would say that we benefited from having to do everything. I learned to do everything. You know, I learned to shoot film and process it, edit it, get my fingers caught in all the machinery that the station had, write copy, put up pictures, go on the air, do it all. And mostly I learned a real appreciation of what covering real news can mean to a community the size of Omaha on a first-class television station. That's the way it was a little more than 24 hours ago. The preamble of a storm that brought death, destruction, and despair to the immediate Omaha area and surrounding communities. Good evening, I'm Tom Brokaw. Beginning at this station, I've always felt at KMTV, put me a two, three, four years up on my colleagues of the same age because I learned so much here and learned it well. By the time I got to NBC a couple of years later, for example, I could go back in an editing room and talk to the editors kind of their language, and they liked working with me as a result of that, and I could do those things. These students going up the steps of Omaha Central High School are only a small part of the some 85,000 young people jamming into Omaha's public and parochial classrooms this fall. I started doing the 5.30 weathercast, somewhere between 5.30 and 5.45, I think we were doing. And uh, they, they hired a guy, uh, uh, to Eric Adams, uh, to, from Minnesota, to do the news. And then they put me on the early weather. But then uh, I think uh, Jim King uh, did the sports and weather at 10. Uh, and uh, then Eric did the news. And Eric Adams came in the studio one day, and uh, I was getting ready with the weather and Jim King with the sports, and he keeled over of a heart attack. And uh, Jim took over the news, and I just continued with the weather, and we went on live doing the news while a rescue unit was in here, which drove right into the studio, uh, into KUTV studio, and was uh, removing uh, Eric uh, to take him to the hospital. And then he died uh, a few days after that, or a couple of weeks after that. At that point, it was a surprise to me. This is a long story getting into here, but it was a surprise to me that I got a call at home, and they said they wanted me to start doing the newscast. Here is Lee Terry. Good evening. Tonight, police continue to investigate the sordid story of a 15-year-old girl who admits she became involved with 20 men after she ran away from her West Omaha home four days ago. Well, I had never been on camera. All my work had been as a writer, as a photographer, as a cameraman. I did a lot of radio work, but I had never been on camera until I came to Omaha. After I'd been here a year, uh, we did stories on Egypt and Israel. We did stories on India and Pakistan. We did stories on uh, Indonesia and uh, Singapore. And uh, then we got into Vietnam in May of 1965. And uh, we found some... Uh, men from this particular area. We filmed them, uh, they were on the air, and that was the beginning. Everybody wanted to see those men, and as a result, uh, we started from that, and then I kept going back every year to do uh, our Christmas show sometimes this summer. Uh, and we, we tried as much as we could to, to bring home to the people here what uh, their young men and women were, were doing. This afternoon, Coach Bill Glassford of the University of Nebraska announced his resignation. Bill, first of all, we'd like to ask you... To me, you why. people would say, oh, gee, uh, the shift from radio to TV, it didn't, it didn't bother me at all. Some of the guys, it did, but uh, I just uh, went ahead and did it, and, but you couldn't you could go on radio without a shave and no tie and uh, 
and look real bad, but on TV you had to be a little bit concerned about your appearance. And newscasting then, you were the newscaster. You delivered all of the news. And now, to me, the newscaster is a sort of a master of ceremonies of the news. He does a little, and he introduces Joe from City Hall, and then he'll read a 30-second story, and then he introduces Pete from Ags Arben, and so on and so on. And uh, so he is, to me, more a master of ceremonies than an actual newscaster. Because uh, when I started, you had a half-hour news. You did a half-hour of news. And that was it. Good evening, everyone. Ray Clark speaking with the Standard TV News Roundup. And in the news tonight, a uh, hot and fiery session is on the city council chambers. As Gee, we just didn't know what to do with it. We have the right to start with it. What do you do with it? You don't read it as radio news. That isn't any good. That isn't television. Uh, one of the things we were, well, kind of, I think they were pretty worried about. What is television news, for instance, if you're going to sit there and read the script? Uh, that's radio news. How do you make it different? How, what, what's the good of television if you're just using, using radio? Radio is so strictly a reading matter. And the television was so completely a matter of picturing something that uh, somehow they separated themselves quite distinctly. The officials of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation next week will begin paying a 40% dividend to the holders of claims against the defunct Sheldon, Iowa National Bank. Today we're at the deck dawn of a new decade. The fabulous 50s are history, the golden 60s still a newborn mystery. What's happened the past 10 years is now recorded fact. What happens tomorrow and over the next 10 years can only be prognosticated. I think the fact that television was so revolutionary, it was so innovative, so different, so new, was part of the reason why we got by with some of the damn fool things that we did in television news in those days. The people were not very critical of us. Ratings weren't very important then. <laughs> if you, if you if you can conceive of a time in the television business when news ratings were not important, that was it. The only time ratings were important was in primetime programs. And nobody even heard about ratings in primetime programs at that time. At least we didn't. We didn't care. Omaha's remarkable growth during the 50s can be measured in many ways, but perhaps it's best illustrated by the expansions and the improvements undertaken by its vital necessities. To have brought fair skies in this region, the weather segment of local newscasts was no less important then than it is now, but in those early days, there were no sophisticated computers to forecast weather. Well, I used to make a trip every day to the uh, Weather Bureau at uh, Epley Field in Omaha, and uh, I'd go out there and sketch off everything I needed uh, that was available there, and they had all the information, of course. And now let's look at tonight's weather. We find that today in this region on our national weather map, we had a cold front that went through the area and it caused us to have a tornado warning during the early afternoon, which was called off later in the day. Then we had fair skies and tomorrow, we're expecting that cold front to have brought fair skies in this region and temperatures dropping to about 85. From time to time, I'd try to do a little educating. I'd. Uh, show things and explain why things were happening as well as just give a forecast and uh, that was always uh, gratifying to be able to do that because you felt like you were going a little beyond just uh, saying the words of what was going to happen in the forecast it's hard to believe that it was that important to people but it's really nice to think that, uh, that you were doing something that i was doing something that people depended on as I recall, I went up to the KMTV studios and they'd auditioned a whole bunch of other people, but Butternut Coffee wanted a guy that could draw silly pictures, and that was me. I was the only one, apparently, that was stupid enough to do that. And so when I draw, drew Beanie, why they thought, gee, that's, that's pretty good. Let's have Beanie illustrate the, the weather forecast. Now, originally, I called, I, called, uh, I called him Bud, and it was a sort of a childhood creation when I was about 
10 years old. And then when Butternut Coffee became the sponsor of the weather show and wanted me to draw this little bud or this parrot, we decided to call him Beanie because it had more to do with the coffee bean. You see the relationship there. I had a product to sell, and that was weather. And the only way I could sell it was through a channel of communication such as television. So I was greatly interested in it, and naturally the Weather Bureau was interested in too in getting the information out to the public. And everybody's interested in weather. And I think weather affects every facet of our way of living. And uh, the, we all know that the farmer makes good use of weather information. But of course, now and then people are unhappy when we predict the wrong weather for their picnics. If we had perfect weather and perfect forecasts, we still couldn't make all the people happy because too much sunshine, I had complaints, too much rain. There was always somebody that just hated that particular brand of weather. Hi, I'm Arnold Peterson, and this is Frank Arney. Hi. From Lyme. <laughs> oh, never mind, Frank. Each weekday at 12.10, we deliver the complete farm and weather news as part of WOW-TV's four-star news. In those days, everyone was an ad-libber uh, because uh, it, that's the way you had to perform. Uh, it was live, and uh, even the commercials were live. I can remember uh, that in an evening, there would be six to eight sets around here, and the cameras would just move from one set to the other as they had to do the commercials and then come back to the regular program. Uh, anybody today just doesn't realize what that was like. And people who had trouble memorizing, for instance, just had, a, had an awful time. Uh, uh, we had idiot cards, of course, and, and all that sort of thing, but there had to be a lot of memorization work done. But being a, uh, an ad-libber really helped. Omaha was an exciting television city. It was a time when the networks weren't so structured and demanding, when the stations still had a lot of individualism. There were strong people operating the Omaha stations. The city was vibrant. It was a wonderful time, early 60s, Omaha, and a young television weatherman, very much in his formative years, was given incredible leeway. If there had been no tornado, would you have looked forward to staying here the rest yes. of your life? Yes, I think so. You had friends? Yes, we hate you, to miss, leave this town. You feel this community had uh, enough spirit and heart to last for years upon oh, years? Oh, I think so. We're very closely tied here. The style of my presentation was innovative at the time. I had a wonderful arrangement there. The weather and sports were a combined segment. Lee Terry would do 10 minutes of news, and then I would have up to 10 minutes to do the weather and sports and divide the time however I wished, depending upon what was going on with sports, what was going on with the weather. So sometimes I could do rather elaborate productions. There were some charming junior high school girls who made costumes for me. A George Washington costume on his birthday. Uh, before Big Bird had been invented by PBS, they made a, a Big Bird costume for me, which I wore on the weather. Uh, there was really no limit to what could happen. And one night I was even arrested by the city of Council Bluffs on, in the middle of the broadcast uh, for uh, failing to report the Council Bluffs temperature, I believe. Uh, we had lots of exciting things happen and good times. In an era before videotape highlights and isolated cameras, Omaha sportscasters had to rely on less sophisticated tools to bring us the sports news of the day. In the sports news tonight, two new professional sports are very much in the highlight. Down in Dallas, Texas, they held a quarterback session for the new entry there in the American Football League. Meanwhile, back in the nation's capital, the Continental League for 1960 was struck out. The bill, the Keith Walker Sports Bill, went back to committee. It was a, a media that offered unlimited challenges. You winged it, you did what you could do, you had ideas, you go with it, and we just had a lot of fun. It, it was a lot of fun to do it. And you had no second choices. Um, basically, you had no opportunity at the start in there to videotape anything or to film anything. When you got ready to go with it, that was it. And good or bad, that's what the public saw. And uh, lots of times, uh, it, it sort of, I like, I lost my uh, cool several times, you well know. I was known to giggle. And uh, 
Well, if it was funny to me, I could imagine what it might be to somebody else, but uh, the, uh, the opportunity was just unlimited to get in there and do things. And uh, I think that one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do in 17 years in front of the camera is smile. But I developed this type of a personality approach, and I thought maybe I might get along with it like this, see. But uh, sometimes the alliteration that comes out, you can't deliver a script when you're talking like this. But uh, I, I think you get the point. Uh, I've tried to be just as honest and uh, straight with you as I can in the sports presentation, and uh, I want to thank you one and all for staying with me, tolerating Jack. I've never had a job. I've had just link recreational activities <laughs> that somebody paid the, the utility bills and the rent bills for me for, for all these years because it's, it's just been that kind of thing. That people, I am sure, all over this country and all over the world would love to have just the opportunity to do the things, go to the places that I've been to as a working guy. Well, hi, everybody. Against the backdrop of the Kentucky Derby of the first Saturday of racing at Exarbon, a full Major League Baseball schedule, Coach Bob Devaney and the staff put on their inner squad game to wind up spring practice. One, you know, I thought it was so cool. I'd, I'd get there two seconds before the lens went on. And I thought, you know, nothing to do this. People out there don't know that. But one night I tied my tie and had it outside my collar the whole time. So then I realized that probably I better allow, instead of five seconds, maybe I better allow 15 or 20. The reason was, we were so competitive, and the news wires would run halftime scores, but I wanted later than that. And you remember down at the old uh, Channel 3 Studios downtown, the parking lot was right behind the back door. And I had a really good radio in my car, so I'd go out and I'd listen to uh, the BYU score in basketball season, uh, or football, uh, on the car radio. And then I could pick up WWL in New Orleans and get anything for Louisiana State. So we'd have three or four big games that we would have a much later score. I'd say, well, eight minutes to play in the ball game, and the wire service had any money yet. So that was one of the reasons why I was dressing on the run. Yeah, when we first started out uh, with Channel 7, whether you worked in sports or whether you worked in news or wherever you worked, uh, you did all different kinds, from booth announcing to uh, quiz shows, kids shows. Uh, you had to be extremely versatile. Instead of being a specialty in the business, uh, you did all kinds of things. Uh, I did all kinds of things, starting out as a booth announcer, uh, eventually winding up in sports. Uh, but I did in, in between, I did news, I did weather, did a kid show, quiz show, uh, commercials, you name it. Here's an important question to ask yourself. Is your family covered against loss of income if you're unable to work because of illness or accident? In one low-cost health insurance package, Mutual of Omaha now offers you protection against staggering hospital bills, big doctor bills, plus loss of income. In that particular time, I think there were only four or five of us in the newsroom, total, including the news director and the people that worked in it and the guy that the, the news director was usually the anchor at that time. Um, so we did everything. Uh, I learned how to operate a motion picture camera uh, because you had to go out and do your own filming. I learned how to write scripts because you had to write your own script. I learned how to edit film because you had to edit your own film. Uh, everything that appeared on the air, you had to do yourself. There was nobody else to call upon to do it. Uh, I think Buddy Blattner might be rather new to some of our Omaha viewers. Tell us a little bit about Bud, will you, uh, Diz? Well, you know, uh, Buddy has teamed up with me now to do the Game of the Week on uh, TV this year, and I want to say right now it's a pleasure to have him on my side. Today, as you look at a sports cast, they give the announcer two and a half, three and a half, maybe four minutes if he's real lucky. I had uh, frequently eight and a half minutes, and I could do an in-depth four or five minute interview always tried to do them live in the studio uh, well i guess we didn't have the access to the other uh, ways of doing things but we would bring to the studio uh, somebody different almost every night of the week and we were able to cover the total spectrum of sports very well bob would you say that when the opening ball of 1955 is tossed out of denver it'll be triple a ball or will it be something else well let me uh, be more positive it was just a new experience every day and uh, I just hope that the audience uh, enjoyed it half as much as we did. Well, thanks to you, Buddy Blattner, to you, Dizzy Dean, and we'll be looking forward to our first telecast of Major League Baseball on March the 13th. The year was 1921. The site was our first Western Electric Service Center at 43rd and Cummings. AT&T began a tradition in Omaha back then. Today, 5,500 AT&T people all over Omaha continue our tradition of quality products and service. 
from computers to long distance to the hardware that keeps the nation's telephones working. For all your telecommunications needs, in Omaha, we're the right choice. AT&T. This is the second year that the Omaha Telecasters Educational Foundation has presented scholarships to students living in the Nebraska-Iowa viewing area of channels 3, 6, and 7. A total of $16,000 was presented to the following students, including two winners of the Johnny Carson Scholarships, Edward Southwick of UNO and Teresa Klein of Bellevue College, and eight other award winners. The Omaha Telecasters Educational Foundation extends sincere congratulations to these 10 scholarship winners. Good evening, everyone. This is Dave Blackwell in El Paso, Texas, the site of the Sun Bowl. Tomorrow it's going to be the Bulldogs of Georgia against the Huskers of Nebraska in the Sun Bowl game. Nebraska going into the game with a record of 8-2, and two, Georgia 5-4-1. If I had any success here in, in uh, Omaha, it was Lyle Bremser in Nebraska football because I was just another television guy. But being with Lyle, who, had, who was super, so popular, and then having Nebraska, uh, Nebraska's success, and having Bremser and Nebraska's success made me as a broadcaster here, and it wasn't me, and I mean that. Oklahoma and Nebraska, 1971. That was unbelievable. Rogers takes the ball at the 30. He's hit and got away. Back up field at the 35, to the 40. He's to the 45. He's to the 50, to the 45, to the 40, to the 35, to the 20, to the 10. He's all the way home. Holy moly. Man, woman, and child did that. Put him in the aisles. Johnny the Jet Rogers just tore him loose from their shoes. Last stood throughout the entire game. It was a long ball game. Longest post-game show that I've ever been involved in my entire life. I think John Melton was up there. I think Osborne stopped by. We went on and on and on. It was, it was the greatest ball game I've ever seen, e either in person or, or the, uh, otherwise. But, you know, with everything going. And I'll never forget Lyle. As I said, he stood throughout the entire game. And you have to see him. And he, and all of a sudden, he said, Blacks. I said, what, Lyle? He said, Blacks. My legs. They're gone. Blacks. I think I'm having a heart attack. And he looked up in dead seriousness. We were not on the air. He's not doing it for a fact. He says, but dear Lord, if you want me, take me now because I've seen it all. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought he was going to have a heart attack. And I hyperventilated in that ball game. I thought I was saying goodbye, too, and I was you know, in my early 30s. And... Some might say it may be stretching it to call all-star wrestling a sport. However, there is no denying it was an immensely popular entertainment package on local television. Yeah, without television, uh, uh, wrestling, you know, just wouldn't exist. And in the beginning, television had a hard time existing without wrestling. Uh, I looked back at some of the old uh, program, wrestling programs that we had, and in some of the cities, and this is the early 50s, wrestling was on seven nights a week in prime time. Did you get the bell tonight? I'm not giving it up. Schmidt, as you saw, was in here a little while ago trying to get that belt. He's going to get over my dead body. I'll tell you, you that. You want to meet him again real soon? <laughs> as soon as possible, I'll cancel all engagements. If I get a match back here in Omaha with that guy. We did not have the network at that time, so we, we came into Omaha, and uh, we started out here in the parking lot <laughs> in the hot summer, I remember, and I think I was on the first program, but it was, uh, gee, we just had all kinds of people would stop and watch those matches. I think we stopped traffic out here on, on, the, on Douglas. And uh, it, was, uh, it was fun. It was fun to do. There were a time or two I was pulled up into the ring by my shirt tail by Dick the Bruiser. And uh, uh, you always felt like, well, they wouldn't really hurt me. But uh, you never know. They get pretty excited. They get heated up just like everyone else. So you take a couple of kids out in the sandlot playing football. And one picks up a clinker and throws it at the guy on the other team, and the fight starts. And it's that kind of thing. We were having a, one of these uh, uh, battle royals where you get 16 guys in the ring. And it was my job at that time as the ring announcer when they were thrown over the top rope. They were out of the match. And so we would just announce where the wrestler was out of the match and proceed. And they threw Dog over the top rope, and he landed by me. And I, like I said, I've known Dog for years. I know his brother Butcher and his sister Vivian and the whole family. And I said, Mad Dog was shown out of the match. And he stood there looking at me going, <laughs> and I thought, boy, this is really turning the crowd on. 
And he hauled off and hit me on the side of the head. I think to this day my ear is still ringing, and I thought I can strike him back and really get beat up or just kind of ignore the thing. So I just let it go. Well, hi. I've come inside to show you that now you can bring outdoor cooking indoors. Television was a struggling financial venture in its earliest days, but it wasn't long before local advertisers, as well as announcers and local personalities, recognized the potential this medium held for selling a product. Like a cigarette should. Why don't you contact Nebraska Blue Cross Blue Shield, the largest writers of these coverages in Nebraska. An organization whose sole business is writing hospital medical surgical coverage at the lowest cost possible. The live was a lot more, for lack of a better word, fun. It was a little more tense because you had to do it right. There was no, hey, let's do this one again, guys, because we made a little goof here. And it really made you aware. You had to really concentrate on what you were doing. In the days when we did things live and they had these innovations, the beer companies came out with these zip open packs. You know, anything to make it easy. Well, when you're doing a commercial, you're behind a table and you have the six pack in front of you and you have to display the label. Then we had to reach around like this and catch the uh, paper and zip it open. Well, if you went up or you went down, you tore it off. And then you had to find where the hole was and try to get it. Well, that happened to me. I went and reached over and it tore off. So then I had to reach for it, and it just wouldn't give. So I gave a pull like this, and six cans of beer all fell out on the floor. Hi there, folks. I know that I'm going to be visiting with a lot of you out at the new Ice Capades, that Ice Capades of 1953 that's going to be at the Exarban Coliseum. And you know, they have a production number called the Captivating Kitchen Capers. We thought it was good enough that uh, Brandeis and the Ice Capades tied in together and are bringing you the most fabulous contest you've ever heard of called the Kitchen Caper Contest. Glenn Harris saw me doing a um, freezer, uh, what am I trying to say, clinic type thing at Sears. And so then he called and asked if I would come down and do an interview. And I thought, aha, one of my friends. So I hung up the phone on him. He called back again, and I laughed and hung up the second time. And he called the third time. And he said, you're either interested or you're not. It's up to you, and hung up. So I came down and did the interview. Was terribly nervous, because I had never worked on camera on anything other than commercial, a few commercial things. Talked so fast, you couldn't believe how fast. I'm probably doing it right now. And that was part of what they wanted, was someone that was a fast talker. and could cram a lot into a half hour, and boy, I sure could. And if you haven't entered this Dream Rings contest, remember, you still have plenty of time. That's right, and if you don't know the details, just tune into your TV home, 10 o'clock in the morning, Channel 3, KMTV. I think that at that time, when television was ready for somebody, not just me, but others of us who were natural, um, we weren't the cranked up type stern-faced movie actor, actress, or whatever. We were just down-to-earth people, and I think I think that was part of our, our doing so well. For further information and details, you just tune into your TV home, 10 to 10.30, Monday through Friday. I am Jim Parker, and you have all recognize Elaine Jabetis. Elaine? Thank you, Jim. During the next 30 minutes, we're going to try to bring you the true, spontaneous excitement and glamour of an opening night. And we're going to begin right here backstage. Incidentally, this is a television first. As far as we know, television cameras have never been permitted backstage on an opening night just before curtain time. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the cameras weren't as wonderful as they are now, of course. And you had to be very careful about what you wore. For instance, detail was terribly important because the cameras didn't seem to pick up a lot of wonderful detail. And so you tried to get something that had a, a stripe or a mark of some kind to sort of give it some kind of dimension. Otherwise, it had a very flat look. They didn't know very much about makeup. Then what to wear, whether you should wear street makeup or whether you should have special stage makeup. And we experimented. And I think some of the things we did were pretty awful. And I'm sure we looked pretty awful. I know I did. And it was, um, it was just trial and error all the way. I mean, it was scary because nobody knew. And nobody knew what to tell you. And nobody could give you any advice. And they weren't even sure that this was the best way to go. But we just tried. We did it all. But when this play opens here tonight, it's the culmination of maybe 30 years of planning and the promise of many hits. And thank you so much thank for you, being Elaine. with us tonight. And good luck to you. The future looks bright. A city isn't just buildings. 
It's not a commerce or educational institution. It isn't just doctors, lawyers, dentists, churches, schools, no homes. But it's all of these things welded together by that indispensable ingredient called people. Uh, sometimes commercials were, uh, uh, were tough to memorize. And especially if you had, it was strange when you were doing 10 maybe uh, commercials a day. And uh, uh, I think you, you, you had a, how do I explain it? The curtain only went up, uh, or the, a curtain went up each time. So uh, that was the showing. And you built yourself up to it. You, you, uh, um, you anticipated. Uh, and, and the show was on. After it was over, strange enough, you, uh, someone would ask you maybe uh, uh, the next day what the commercial was about. Sometimes you couldn't remember. You think, well, I, I know, know I did it. but I, Because you, you, you got those things in your mind and, and what you were going to do. And uh, then, then you dropped them. You went on to the other thing. You had to do it. Be salute the many individuals and businesses which have made possible this fine opening night show at the new Omaha Playhouse. I think I went on the air in TV in 51 or 2. Then I started with, but I had a, an interview show at the time. And it was one of those lovely things that happened. I had wanted to have Mrs. B as a sponsor. I didn't really know her then, but it's too long a story to all the machinations of it. But eventually she did buy a spot on the show. And, you know, she has such marvelous health, and she's such a stalwart and strong, thank God, that uh, she's never sick. But during this time that she had bought this spot, she got a cold, had to stay home, and she watched the program. And she liked the way I talked about her carpeting. At that one and only bargain-loving Nebraska Furniture Mart, 700 South 72nd, Omaha. And it was a match. I mean, we fell in love with each other and then I started uh, I did not get a, become associated with her until 1954 she hounded me into opening my own business with her as my number one client and then I all had some other clients who were waiting in the wings and so I've you know started my uh, Gene Sullivan advertising in 1954 and I, it's just you see I've been around so terribly 40 years I have been Sticking it in Omaha's ear. <laughs> Forty. Well, long. Forty-four. Oh, imagine. Imagine starting at three years old. I found an unusual hobby in the Yellow Pages. Where? Under garbage collection. I found rabbits in the Yellow Pages. Where? Under duplicating machines. When color television came to Omaha, local advertisers began to change their thinking, and local television talent had to make some changes, too. Well, it made it a lot of difference, at, uh, first of all, to the women that were on the air. You know, we mentioned earlier about the clothes, black and white were not good, but color didn't mean anything either until color came in, and then you could dress, and, and, and it made a lot of difference in that sense. But then when I was doing commercials or a show that dealt with fashion, it made all the difference in the world. The television uh, couldn't attract the retailer for the longest time because they said, well, you can't see the merchandise. You can't see the clothes. You can't, the color is what really makes it happen. So when color came in, then there was a great uh, reaction among the retailers and fashion people to use the medium for, uh, as an advertising medium, whereas before they just couldn't relate to it at all. First thing they did was make me a redhead. Uh, I had sort of a, I guess, pumpkin-colored kitchen, you'd call it, and my hair just didn't look right. So they ended up after 10 or 12 different takes of whatever to make me a redhead, and I stayed that way until I turned gray. <laughs> I loved it. But the makeup was different. Um, the clothing I wore, I had to be very selective in picking out the right colors that would not only look well, but would blend with the kitchen. You know, you couldn't have something just fighting with the kitchen colors either. You had to, to have everything sort of blend together right. So it was kind of a, a chore, but it was fun. We had a lot of fun in color. Oh, that was exciting. The, the problems, uh, it was just probably a, just a little bit more planning and thinking naturally about your clothes, uh, coordinate those. Uh, the hair uh, had to be lightened up, brightened up, you know. Uh, your makeup was much, was much more important then, too. I didn't uh, 
particularly experienced a, any really problems outside of a few changes like that. Television has advanced rapidly in 35 years. Though they didn't realize it at the time, the men and women in front of and behind the cameras in those early days were pioneers. It was a time that brings back fond memories for those who experienced it in Omaha. Omaha was good for a lot of young people coming up in broadcast news. In fact, all through the broadcasting area. It's interesting. There are several cities around the, new, the country that have always had reputations as good markets or good news markets. Omaha's always been one of them, and I'm certainly glad for the time I had there. I think most people, if they start in local television, which is the best place to start, and do a little bit of everything, um, it, uh, it, it puts you in good stead later when you're doing a, on a regular show because you say you can fall back on some experiences and, uh, and go back to old things. On this show, for example, time to time we'll pull out and we'll even be talking about some of the early days. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I cannot think, I honestly could not draw up today a better place for me to have come to work in my first job or a better job description than what Mark Gautier had in mind for me. I learned from him. You know, there are too few people like that left anymore. They teach, and they make you do it again until you get it right, and they care about the fundamentals of the news business. That was very important to me. It was very important to you and all the people who passed through there. Omaha Television was absolutely alive and, and happy and full of live productions. Every station was doing lots of programs. You don't find that today. You didn't find it then in most markets. Sure, those were the best of times. I'll never forget them. The best years of my life in working news in Omaha. This is Steve Bell, WOW-TV News. Good evening, everyone. This is Dave Blackwell in El Paso, Texas, the site of the Sun Bowl. Hello, everybody. I'm Martha Bolson, and this is our new WOW Television Kitchen. Nebraska Health Authorities report there are no outbreaks of Asian flu in the state right now. So we hope you keep watching the program. We hope you've had a Merry Christmas. It has been denied by the Planning Commission, but the City Council still will have the final say. The rubble of twisted steel, brick, wood, which once was Mr. Eichhorst's business. That this isn't the easiest thing in the world to do, and it's impossible unless you have it all organized in advance. I'm not giving it up. Schmidt, as you saw, was in here a little while ago trying to get that belt, and he's going to get over my dead body. Remember, this is your playhouse, Omaha's gift to Omaha, and we want you to enjoy it. How did it happen? Why did it happen? And what caused the explosion? And all of these things are necessary to people to enable them to live, to learn, and to grow in a community. So glad to see you. It happens every day. We've got to get off this uh, microphone and off this television set. Here's an important question to ask yourself. Is your family covered against loss of income? It can happen anywhere, anytime, to anyone, in any form. Both Bob Devaney and the staff put on the... WT, KETV, and KMTV. Thank you for tuning us in for the last 36 years. We look forward to being a part of your future. Special thanks to Arlo Grafton for pulling this ambitious project together, and to AT&T for their efforts in supporting the Omaha Telecasters Educational Foundation. Week shop High V for good values on all your holiday picnic favorites like High V pops 15 cents a can plus deposit frozen twin pops 20 count box a dollar 29 High V potato chips 66 cents and gala paper towels 49 cents shop where saving is a picnic High V where there's a helpful smile in every eye. Calcium and protein too Helps us feel good in whatever we do Kick! So get on a health kick, let it pour America's favorite health kick Get on a health kick, milk's got more Have more milk, cause milk's got more Tony Cervantes, tonight at 10